All right, the Bible in seven passages. Uh, this is passage, uh, lesson number six. We're doing passage number six today. Title of the lesson, The Promise Re uh, Realized, and the passage is Romans 6, uh, verses one to 14. Um, let's quickly review the five passages we have looked at that are part of the seven passages that summarize the content of the uh, Bible, the ones that I've chosen anyways. Seven passages that contain enough information that with only these scripture references, a Christian could preach the gospel to convert a non-believer and keep faith until, until death. Kind of a tall order. The five uh, passages, Genesis 1.1 1, 1, uh, gives us the creation. Passage number two, Genesis 3 verses 1 to 24, God's promise to fallen man, the promise of the Redeemer to come. Genesis 11, 27 to 12, verse seven, the person of the promise, the historical person through Abram and Abraham, uh, the historical uh, person um, uh, you know, outlined throughout the uh, Jewish history. Uh, passage number four, Isaiah 53, one to 12, the person of the promise from a spiritual perspective, from a prophecy, a, pr a, pr a prophetical uh, uh, perspective. And then uh, in the New Testament, the uh, fifth passage, John 3, 14 to 16, the promise revealed. What was the promise? Well, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. That was the promise and that was how that promise would be realized. So today's lesson will examine the sixth passage of scripture, Romans 6, 1 to 14, the promise not revealed, but the promise realized. So this passage is not actually part of the gospel message, but rather a defense of the way God's promise to man was realized and worked out in a believer's life. So before examining it more closely, it'll be helpful to review the reasons why Paul had to actually provide this information. So we do a little background here. We need to understand that it all began with a lie. It all began with a lie. The promise from God to send a savior was made because Eve believed Satan's first lie. And what was that lie? The serpent said, you surely will not die. Genesis 3 verse 4. Satan seduced the woman with the promise of knowledge and an elevated position equal to God based on the false notion or the lie that not only had God lied to her about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he did so out of selfishness. In other words, uh, the lie that Satan gave to Eve was that God didn't want Adam and Eve to attain their full potential. That was the lie, the substance of it anyways. It's interesting to note that what the devil suggested Eve was missing out on, which was knowledge and elevated position, were similar to the things that he himself had, because of sinful pride, aspired to, and was cast down by God because of it. We read in other passages in Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. This was Isaiah giving uh, a description to the aspiration of the devil, if you wish, uh, that made him fall in the first place. And uh, in Ezekiel, that prophet, again, also gives to the devil this aspiration. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, I put you before kings that they may see you. And so his lie led to the fall of Adam and Eve, but in his judgment on them, God included a promise that the seed of woman, this would be a person born of a woman without the participation of a man, because the seed is usually provided by the male, and the promise was that this person would destroy the evil one, thus freeing mankind from sin. Genesis 3.15. So Satan had seriously damaged man and the creation 
But with the promise, God had limited that damage and set into motion a plan to ultimately redeem mankind. All of this was, you know, we talked about this in the beginning of Genesis. Satan now focused his efforts on the delay or the destruction of God's promise because its completion meant his own destruction. And so the story of the Jewish nation in the Old Testament, you know, their wars, their setbacks, times of glory, as well as times of wickedness and descent into idolatry, all of these are really the story of Satan's attempt to delay or destroy the people who were carrying forth God's promise of eventual salvation. Once Jesus, um, um, the promise made unto man arrives, Satan continues his attacks, his lies, in order to discredit or to destroy Jesus. No longer necessary to destroy the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation you know, did what it was supposed to do. It brought forth you know, the Savior. Now Satan's attacks are directed towards the Savior. And so from the temptation in the desert to his death on the cross, Jesus was subjected to unrelented attacks by Satan and those that he influenced against him. And so the resurrection of Jesus was the clear sign that Satan had failed. But this did not deter him from continuing his assault on Christ and now those who believed in him. And so the, you know, the attack was against Adam and Eve and then it was against the Jewish nation and then it was against Christ and now it's against those who follow Christ. It, it doesn't end. We see that not long after the gospel was preached and the church was established, the pattern of attack and obstruction and attempt to undermine began once again. We see Satan's aggression in many instances. For example, the apostles were arrested, right? And they were beaten and they were threatened not to preach the gospel. And we see the killing of Stephen in Acts chapter seven. And then there's the general persecution of the church by the Jews. And then the persecution and arrest of Paul, one of the uh, main apostles uh, who was bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And then there was the general persecution of the church, not by the Jews, but by the Romans. Just a continual attack to try to destroy Christ, the promise, those who received the promise. And yet, despite all of this, the church flourished and grew throughout the Roman Empire and beyond to the point that 2.4 billion, that's 33% of the world's population, are believers. The attacks on the church continue to this day as well. According to opendoorusa.org, 245 million Christians experience high levels of persecution for their faith. And these are Christians that live in mostly uh, countries where they are oppressed by uh, Muslims. But Satan's most dangerous attack is not the one against people or the buildings where they meet, but against what Christians teach and live by, and that is God's word. This was the target of the first lie in the garden. Satan cast doubt on what God said. I go, I go back to it again. Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. There was the, there was the first lie being set up. So this line of attack continued throughout the history of the Jewish nation with false prophets and idolaters, crediting their words and teachings from God, when in reality they were doing Satan's work. I mean, just a few examples. From King Ahab's false prophets in 1 Kings to the prophets of Baal, Jeremiah chapter two, even in the New Testament, bar Jesus, right? Elymas, trying to stop, tried to frustrate Paul the apostle's work. And so the false prophets and teachers even infiltrated the church in an attempt to destroy it from the inside. See, as far as Satan is concerned, destroying or compromising God's word in some way 
will stop everything else because the promise is embodied and empowered and fully realized in and through God's word. If you destroy the word and you destroy Christianity and you destroy everything that Christianity supports. Now in the first century, the Bible mentions two groups that seriously threaten the unity and spiritual peace possessed by churches of that era. The first were the Judaizers. Their doctrines, their false teachings were aimed at the Jews who converted to Christianity. And then you had the Gnostic teachers. These uh, teachings were, not, uh, were aimed at Gentiles who had become uh, uh, Christians. And so these were two main methods that Satan was attacking the church from the inside, trying to destroy the word and as it was taught in those uh, times. So let's uh, take a look at a little bit uh, what these people taught. It'll make sense of the passage that we're going to read after. The Judaizers taught basically that you had to become a Jew before you could become a Christian. That was basically what they were teaching. This required circumcision, they said, and obeying certain food laws. The idea being that, well, Jesus himself was a Jew, and if you wanted to become one of his disciples, well, you too had to become a Jew. And in order to become a Jew, well, you had to be circumcised, and you had to follow food laws, and you had to do this, and you had to do that. In other words, these people wanted to bring the Christians, the Jewish converts to Christianity, back under the law. And Paul says, you know, if you go back unto the law, you've fallen away from grace. The Gnostics, they taught that they had a superior gospel. And if disciples followed them, they would also follow their hidden or their secret gospel. The idea here was that in following these leaders, the Christians uh, won over would have to stop accepting Paul's teachings, because they had a better gospel, they had a super gospel, they had secret knowledge. And their secret knowledge was <laughs> pretty much the same thing as the Judaizers, trying to bring people under a system of law, keeping rules, asceticism, certain food laws, denying marriage, so on and so forth. Okay. So when reading Paul's instruction in Romans chapter six, verses one to 14, passage number six in our series, we recognize that he is responding to the two lies that were circling around the gospel at this critical time in the church's development, lies that threatened the stability of the young church. One threatened to change how we respond to the gospel and the other actually tried to change the gospel itself. So our sixth passage, Romans 6, 1 to 14, destroys these two attempts to change or compromise and thus destroy the gospel's content, or as Paul refers to it in Romans 1, 16, the gospel's power. And so in this particular section of Romans, Paul is responding to a supposed question about the efficiency of God's grace and one's attitude regarding God's mercy from the way he answers, the question seemed to be the following. If God's grace ever expands to cover sin at every level of gravity, why not sin and sin more in order to cause more of God's grace to be manifested? Only people who stay up late at night thinking about things could come up with such a question. <laughs> so the question demonstrates a nice bit of what we call sophistry or false argument, if you wish, as well as a misunderstanding of how both sin and grace work in real life, not just words in a, in a debate. So Romans chapter six, Paul answers this question. Now the question doesn't appear in the book of Romans. We only suppose that this is the question from the answer Paul gives. So here's his answer in Romans chapter six, verses, we'll start reading verses one to seven. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? 
Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. So first of all, Paul repeats and rejects the premise of the question. You know, in other words, more sin produces more grace. In his reply, he points to the response believers make to the preaching of the gospel. You hear the gospel, what's the response you make? Well, the response is in Acts 2.38, right? Peter said to them, you know, the crowd said to Peter, what do we do? We killed the Son of God. We murdered our own Messiah. What do we do now? And so Peter answered, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so here Peter describes what those who believed in Jesus were to do in order to express their faith. Paul explains the meaning of what they are doing. See, Peter doesn't explain the meaning of it. He just tells them what they're to do. It's Paul that explains the meaning. Now, the Judaizers, who insisted that conversion was not complete without circumcision, were tying salvation to a symbol that tied a person to the people who carried the promise forward until the appearance of the promise as Jesus Christ. That symbol and that ceremony, circumcision, was no longer necessary or relevant because the task it represented was complete. Paul explains that the new symbol and ceremony, baptism, which is immersion in water, now expresses a new truth received and activated by faith. In baptism, we receive the blessings realized by the coming of the promise brought into this world by the Jewish people through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Paul explains that through baptism, a believer reenacts the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul points out, however, that our symbolic physical death, burial, and resurrection in the waters of baptism has not a symbolic, but an actual spiritual result that circumcision only pointed to, but could never accomplish. See, the original problem that the promise of God was sent to fix was the problem of sin. Since Adam, all were guilty of sin and condemned to eternal separation from God because of it. Romans 3.23 and 6.23 teach that. Even if a man was aware of the effects of sin, he was helpless to avoid the consequences of sin because his weakened spiritual nature could not overcome sin completely, thus freeing him from its power, effect, and consequences on him. Add to this mix the efforts of Satan to constantly lead the world into sinful behavior and thwart all sincere efforts to obey God and live righteously. You have a world that's fallen, a world that's lost. Now, the good news that Paul preached and was explaining here was that Jesus offered this perfect sinless life through His death on the cross as a payment for the moral debt owed to God by sinful men and women. Once that debt was paid for and confirmed, meaning that the offering was accepted to God, and this was made known through Jesus' resurrection, right? What does Paul say? In Romans 1 verse 4, that the resurrection is like, a, is like a, a, a divine receipt paid in full. How do we know that Jesus' death on the cross pays the moral debt for my sins? How do I know that to be true? <laughs> the resurrection, that's how you know it. 
God raised Jesus from the dead to prove that everything that He said and promised was fulfilled. Okay. So God now had a way to deal with sin that would permit imperfect people the gift and the privilege of being united with God once again. That way, made possible by Jesus' cross, was forgiveness received by faith and not by restitution. This was the good news. I have to pause here. I have to repeat this. If there's one mistake that Christians make, it's this. Right here, I repeat. The way man is redeemed is through Jesus' cross. Jesus' cross permits forgiveness and that forgiveness is received by faith. In other words, I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sins, okay? I receive forgiveness based on faith, not on restitution. I do not make restitution for my sins. Jesus makes restitution for my sins. So many people confuse repentance with restitution. They think repentance is restitution. I make up, you know, in repentance, I make up for the bad things that I did, the bad things that I said, the things that I messed up in my life. You know? Repentance means that I make up for that. No. Repentance is a forward looking thing. In the future, I do not repeat the mistakes that I made in the past, or I certainly make an attempt not to repeat the mistakes I made in the past. The restitution is made by the cross. Every lie, every foolish thing I did, every disobedient act, every broken promise, everything wrong that I have done that needs paying for is paid for by the cross not by my restitution. My repentance is simply an act of faith. I believe, so therefore I change. I change my attitude about this and that and the other. So sins were forgiven in the waters of baptism because this is where the believing sinner expressed his faith in Jesus Christ. You know, people ask us, you mean you believe that baptism is necessary? Well, yes, I believe baptism is necessary. Oh, you're a legalist. No, I'm not. I believe baptism is necessary because that's where God tells me to express my faith. I said, Lord, I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. What do I do? He says, believe. Okay, how do I show you I believe? Be baptized. He could have said, make restitution for all your sins. <laughs> If you believe, then you better pay back what you owe me. I'm so glad he didn't say that. He said, change your ways in the future and be baptized to demonstrate that you sincerely believe. And so faith was not expressed in circumcision as the Judaizers taught. Faith was not expressed in perfect obedience as the legalists and the Pharisees claimed. Faith was not expressed in the discovery of secret knowledge or loyalty to certain teachers as the Gnostic teachers taught. Faith was not expressed in severe treatment of the body or rejection of marriage and the making of vows as the ascetics then and now taught and promote. Since Pentecost Sunday, when Peter preached the gospel for the first time after Jesus ascended into heaven, faith in Jesus Christ is the basis of our salvation, which consists of forgiveness for sins so that we can become acceptable and therefore able to come before God and we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so we can be united with the Father and Jesus forever. The Holy Spirit joins with our spirit to enable this. 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 and 12a. 
So this section, among other things, was the teaching and the response to every effort to change the gospel in any way. Paul explains what God's, quote, promise, carried by the Jews, fulfilled and realized by Jesus Christ and proclaimed by the apostles, what that promise consisted of and how those who understood and believed it were to respond and the very real blessings those who responded faithfully would receive. And so the second part of this section answers the question about sin and grace in Romans 6, 8 to 14. He says, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so in this passage, Paul explains the true role of God's grace in a believer's life. Grace is not some kind of spiritual free pass to indulge in sin without guilt or consequences as the question suggested. Some people think grace is like, you know, yeah, I get a pass for grace. Yeah. This little sin over here that I do, ah, grace covers that. You know, it's like, ah, no hurry to deal with that one because you know, I'm under grace, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> That's what these guys were thinking. In verse 14, Paul summarizes the entire passage by saying that we, meaning Christians, are not under law, meaning we are not judged by the law. We are forgiven for all of the offenses we committed in violation of the law. In addition, we are not motivated or affected by the law either. The law is not what motivates me. The purpose of the law was to reveal sin and the punishment due to sin. Romans 3, 19 and 20. As Christians, we have been forgiven for all of our sins and consequently will not face condemnation nor punishment. Romans 8 verse 1. This is how we are not under law. Being under grace, on the other hand, meant that we are affected and empowered by grace. It was God's grace that moved him to make and send the promise. It was God's grace that offered salvation based on faith rather than based on law. It is God's grace that moves God to bless us in this life with physical as well as all the blessings in the heavenly realm, Ephesians 1 verse 3. And it is God's grace that offers eternal life with Him and Jesus who sacrificed His life for us. Those are the effects of grace. We're also empowered by grace. Unlike those who saw grace as something to be exploited for personal gratification, Paul explains that the very opposite is what is true. God's grace exploits us to God's glory by enabling us to do the following. God's grace enables me to walk and live in a new way. And I don't know about you, but I remember before I was a Christian, I can tell you right now that I do not walk in the way that I did before I was a Christian. God's grace enables me to break free from the grip of slavery to sin. I sin, of course, and so do you, but I am not a slave to sin. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. Grace enables me to be naturally drawn to God rather than naturally drawn to sin. What is it inside of me and what is it inside of you that makes you want to please God? It's certainly not your flesh. <laughs> I, 
Our flesh just wants to please ourselves. What is it inside of us that makes us override our flesh and want to please God? Well, it's the effect of grace in our lives that makes us want to please God. God's grace enables us to willingly offer ourselves to God in worship and in ministry. I drove you know, on our way to church this morning. I saw a lot of people at the Oki car wash. And I said to Lise, if you're not going to church, Sunday morning's a wonderful morning to go to the, to the what is it, the All-American Diner, have yourself some scramblers, you know, and some fried potatoes and three cups of coffee. Sunday morning and then go to the Oki car wash, have your car wash, you know, do everything before sports on TV starts. You know? It's a beautiful Sunday morning. If you're not one of the people you know, wrangling your kids and getting them to church on time, why do we do that? Grace, grace makes us want to do that. Grace enables us to live in freedom, protected and motivated by God's grace, rather than feeling guilty and dreading death and judgment. I'm, not, I'm afraid of death only because there's going to be pain involved, I think. You know what I'm saying? We think, oh man, what's, uh, is it going to hurt? Is it going to hurt? No, that's, I think that's just human. You, know, you, just, you don't want pain. You don't want some long drawn out thing. You know, if I'm going to die, come on, let's get it over with. You know. <laughs> but the, the crossing over to the other place, yeah, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of that thing. Why? Grace, that's why. It defies, grace defies all reality. Everybody I know dies and has stayed in the ground. None, nobody I know has ever come back except Jesus. And so human history and misery has largely been caused by three lies from Satan. Lie number one is that God is himself a liar. Believing this lie broke the union between man and God from the get-go. That God is a liar. That he won't do what he said he will do. In other words, he won't bless us and give us eternal life or he won't punish us. Like he said, he said, I'll give you eternal life or I'll punish you, one or the other, the first lie is that he doesn't mean it. It's not true. He's a liar. The second big lie is that Satan is God. This lie perpetuated man's focus on himself and what Satan controls in this world. This lie perpetuates the darkness wherever it's believed. Have you, have you taken a look at the, at the traditions of other religions in the world? Painted faces, horns, you know, oh man, alive. You know. When your God is represented by a fat, a fat man with lots of arms, you know, this is your God? <laughs> this is the one you kneel down to? Lie number three, that Jesus is not God. Whether it's outright rejection of Jesus as God or the undermining or change to this word. This lie is constantly mutating and altering its form and its source. Sometimes atheist college professors, sometimes clergymen, sometimes politicians. The end goal is always the same, to deny Jesus his rightful position as the divine Son of God made man with all authority in heaven and on earth, or to discredit or change the promise made to man by God by altering his word or giving it a different meaning. It's always the same game, always. No matter how one summarizes the Bible, seven passages or 700 passages, the end result should always be the same. God the Father sent His divine Son 
to take on a human nature in order to offer his life in death as a payment for the sins of mankind. And those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and express their faith in repentance and baptism, those people will be forgiven all of their sins and they will receive the Holy Spirit and because of that, they will have eternal life. That's about as compact as I can, as I can make the gospel and its promise. In this world, however, if you can destroy the message, you can destroy the church. You know, we hear in the news you know, that in certain countries, uh, especially in Muslim countries, not picking on them necessarily, but this is what the news reports, uh, many church buildings are being burned and bombed and so on and so forth. You know? How foolish they are. Do they actually think that they can destroy our, our religion by burning down our buildings? <laughs> It just goes to show you that they certainly don't get it, do they? This, this, this building, hopefully when it's empty, a tornado could come by and just take it, you know, take it right off the ground, right? Be nothing left but the pad in the, in the ground. Would that destroy us? Absolutely not. I would think that a tragedy like that would probably rise us up even stronger, right? We rebuild that thing in a heartbeat. Maybe another lie, I didn't put it in the, I didn't put it in the, uh, in the notes or anything. And that is the lie that Satan doesn't exist. That's a big lie too. He exists and his sole objective is to destroy us. Okay, it's a serious game. It's a serious thing. You know, we come to church and we sing praises. And, hey brother, how's it going? And we're having a potluck and it's all, yeah, it's all good and, and happy and the kids are running around, it's wonderful. But it's a serious thing because the end game here is the attempt to destroy our souls. Don't let that happen. Know the gospel, preserve the gospel. That's our task, that's our job. Okay, so that's passage Number six, one more to go uh, uh, next week.